Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Grace and Mercy Tuesday night Bible study. I am Bryant Harper, my pastor, Breon Johnson, senior pastor of Grace and Mercy Ministries. Um, once again, this is our Tuesday night Bible study. Um, so right now, we just want to worship God. We always start with worship. Uh, we was created to worship God. He seeks a worship. Weapon, worship is our weapon. And we exalt God. And we magnify God. We put him first and last. He's the beginning and the end. The first and the last, the creator of all things. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's God forever seated on the throne. His word is forever settled. He's the supreme ruler of the universe. He's all power. He's all authority. He's sovereign. But he desires communion with him. To sup with him. To fellowship with him. To bask in his presence. To sit at his feet. Just to honor him. Just in awe of who he is and all that he does. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. There is none like him. He should be our first priority. Seek ye first the king and his kingdom and his righteousness. And everything will be added. He's majestic. I saw our Lord. The one who gave his only begotten son for us. To die for us. To shed blood for us. Yet while we were still in sin. He still chose to die for us. To give us access to him. To come boldly to his throne. It's an honor and a privilege for him to grant us that access. To commune with him. As we worship him in spirit and in truth. For God is a spirit. And they that worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. We lay aside every weight and descend it so easily besets us. For no flesh can glory in his presence. So we want to be closer to you, Lord. Yes, Father. It's his love and kindness that draws us. He's drawing us closer. Mm -hmm. He is our heart's desire. He is the object of our affection. Yes, Lord. Yes, we want to be where you are, Lord. There's peace in your presence. Joy in your presence. Yes, Lord. Just want to be close to you. Nothing else matters when I'm with you. Yes, Lord. Deep calls things under deep. I want to go deeper in you, Father God. Yes, this is relational. It's intimacy. Yes, Lord. Somebody hum the melody 
Uh, she want to seek you in your mind and your heart, your ways and your will, Father God, your thoughts. Amen. Amen. Coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to focus on verses 14 through 16. That'll be 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. And I've entitled this, The Word Matters. Um, of course, the Word has always matters. The Word is all authority. It's all power. Um, Jesus is the Word. Um, but there's a scripture that says that in the last days there will be a famine, not for famine of food or water, but for a famine of the word of God. And uh, the word matters in these times we're living in with the age of deception and all the information that's coming at us and all the things that happen. We need to be girded up in the word of truth, and led by the spirit of truth. So the word is to internalize us. Once we become uh, one with Christ Jesus, um, that's when eternity starts. And he wants to do a complete work. He's already done a complete work in us spiritually, but he wants us, want us to continue to grow in him and the things of him. So the word is to prepare us for what's coming. So we, the word is always to internalize us in context. We want to be in, in proper context or with the particular uh, text and verse and chapter and what the writer is saying at that particular time. And then we bring it into today's time because the word is always relevant. It transcends time, it transcends space. Um, it's all truth. So uh, I just want to give a, a brief recap on what, um, what uh, Paul is doing here. He's writing to um, his son, Timothy. Of course, that's his, um, his son in the ministry. Um, and he, uh, telling him what to do while Paul is away. He's giving him instructions uh, to continue to work in the ministry. And I know we say uh, we have our own personal relationship with God, um, but we always have to submit to some type of authority. Um, the Bible says, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach unless they be sent? Um, so we want to be, um, we, need, we need to be equipped. We need teaching. 
Uh, we need training. Of course, we do have the Holy Spirit to teach and guide us, um, but we still need um, to submit under authority. Uh, nobody is an island unto themselves. Uh, in Ephesians 4 and 11, it says, I will send you some apostles, some prophets, and evangelists, pastors, and teachers uh, for the equipping of the saints to edify the body. So um, we all need to pull from one another. So he's talking to Timothy, and he's telling him to continue to work in the ministry uh, while he's absent. He's telling him to teach the people what he's learned and to pass down to the people that Paul, Timothy has been called to minister to. So understand that you haven't been called to everybody. Your voice is not called to everybody. So Timothy is ministering to a specific people. Uh, he tells them to hardship as good soldiers and not become entangled. That's a popular word in this day and time. But that word was here long before uh, Will and Jada. But it says not to be entangled with the affairs of this life nor to be entangled in no affairs, uh-huh, and to concern himself with pleasing God, and then he will enjoy the fruit of his labor. The Bible says to put our hearts and minds on things above, not on earthly things, uh, for we die, and our life is now hidden in Christ Jesus. So that's what we're talking about, the word eternalize us, the word matters. We want to be focused. That's our primary focus, to be our gaze fixed on the things of God. Obviously, we're not oblivious to what's going on around us. But if we believe that Christ is the answer and that he has the answers and his Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, then that has to be our focus. That has to be our primary. Since Paul tells Timothy um, that he's locked up physically, but that the gospel itself cannot be confined. So that's why we need to open our mouth in and in, in, in all situations, the Bible says, give thanks in all things. Paul says, whether I base or whether I bound, I'm content. I know how to endure. I know how to walk this walk. I know what God has called me to do, and I'm going to walk it out with full power, with full confidence, as the pastor said the other week, with full confidence in the things that God has called me to do in spite of what's going on around me, because Christ is the center of my joy. He's my focus, and this is what he is extolling to Timothy. So he's telling them this also in the, in the aspect that he's telling them to keep, even though Paul is telling Timothy this, he's telling them to keep your gaze on Christ. So he's still leading him to Christ. He's not leading him to himself. So Paul says he isn't willing to do all things for the sake of the elect of Christ. The elect, that would be us, those who accepted Christ as their Lord and as they say. But the elect means the best, the best of its kind. It means excellence. It means preeminent. It means chosen. It means choice. So we are the best of Christ's kind. Uh, in, in Genesis, he, said, he, he looked at all the creation. When he was finished, he said all of it was very good. So when we speak against who God says we are, we're actually operating in false humility. So we need to speak on who God says we are and stand on the promises of God. We're actually saying God knows more about us than, than we know. Actually, we're saying we know about ourselves more than God knows. But if he called us he, his elect, that means we've been chosen before the foundation of the world. That means he gave us a specific assignment. That means that it's not about the worth of what, what you feel, but we're saved by grace through faith. It says Paul talks about the promise that we all have, dying to this world and willing to do a hardship, which means we keep in our mindset a nevertheless. No, it ain't going to feel good to the flesh. No, we ain't always going to like it. Most of the time, we ain't going to like it at all. And I know I don't like this particular situation, but Lord, I'm trusting you in it. If I can't trace you, then I'm going to trust you, whether I'm in prison, whether I have a job or I don't have a job. Uh, whether my finances are right or my finances are not right. Jesus Christ is our hope of glory. And that's why the word is to eternalize us. This is why we need, this is why the word matters. A lot of us say we love God and we love Jesus, but it seems in this day and time, many of us don't love his word. And Christ is the word, so you can't separate the two. They go hand in hand. So he says that in this life, we have eternal life with Christ. Even though we have been unfaithful, Christ has always been faithful and that he will not deny us if we live in him. Um, we say he would never leave us nor forsake us. 
These are the things that we have to get inside of us to eternalize us. So we just won't be quoting scripture. So we won't be going back and forth. So we won't be worrying about certain things uh, because you can't have faith and, and, and worry at the same time. Matter of fact, worry is a sin. Excuse me, my light came out. Worry is a sin. So we need to be fixated on the things of God, always abounding in his work. My light went off. Okay, he's also talking about Christ and him crucifies is the essence of our faith. To always preach the gospel message and that all believers would need to hear and, co and comprehend this. Hardships are a testing of our faith. They work with patience and um, they allow us to grow. They increase our character. So whatever we're dealing with because of who Christ Jesus is, uh, in Galatians it says, be not weary in well-doing. So whenever we're going through whatever, we don't complain, um, we don't murmur, uh, we're not wrapped up and entangled in the affairs of this world. And as long as we keep our focus on the things of this world rather than the things of Christ, um, then we're going to stay in a state of worry. A Roman says, be not conformed to the ways of this world, but you will be renewed by the transformation of your mind. A transformed mind is an eternalized mind. So the word matters. Now, uh, verse number 14 says, Paul is telling Timothy, keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God, excuse me, against quarreling about words. It is of no value. It only ruins those who listen. They're operating in the flesh when we get to uh, quarreling about words, about uh pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, about what color Jesus is, um, about which church you go to. The main thing is we're talking about, are you in Christ? Are you saved? Do you have a conviction? Are you willing to forgive people? Are you willing to say, I'm sorry, instead of waiting for somebody else to say they're sorry? These are the things we're talking about when we're keeping our mind fixated on the things of God. It's a John 6, 63 says the spirit quickened, but the flesh profits nothing. So we gain nothing from operating in the flesh when he tells us to stay away from quarreling because they have no value. And it only ruins those who listen because it, it doesn't eternalize them. It doesn't edify God. It doesn't bring about the things of God. Galatians 5, 14, 16 says for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbors as yourself. 15 says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by one another. 16 says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Um, it serves absolutely no purpose for us to be fussing and fighting and arguing about the word of God. And it seems like that's a lot of, a lot of that is going on right now. Uh, people are upset at people because they won't wear a mask or people are upset at other people because they will wear a mask. Where if you're, if you're wearing a mask, then that means you're not operating in faith. And if you don't wear a mask, then something must be wrong with you. All of these th things that have absolutely nothing to do with the word of God. Now, obviously we want to take precaution, but it's not my job to tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing and vice versa. So we should be thinking, talking about the things of God. They, they don't benefit anything, all of this bickering amongst believers about this particular party and that particular party. We are supposed to be a unified front, a unified body, and the world is watching us, and we're supposed to be drawing people to Christ, and the only way we can do that is if we are Christ-like. So we need more Christ-likeness in this time that we are living in, because uh, Christ is coming back for a spotless bride, a spotless bride. Verse number 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God. Or uh, King James says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. That word study is not study is what we've been taught in this Western world just to memorize scripture. Um, Jesus told the religious people, you think because you know the scriptures that you have eternal life. But the scriptures testify of the person of Jesus Christ. The whole entire Bible is about the person of Jesus Christ. So that should be our focus when studying the word. Study means it means to give diligence. 
It means to seek out earnestly. Um, we're going on a journey with Christ. So when we study the word of God by the spirit of God, we're looking for the person of Jesus Christ, for him to get inside of us and for, her, for us to manifest him in the earth. That's why we study the word. We're not trying to study the word just to memorize scripture. Uh, we're not trying to study the word to prove that we know scripture or that we know more Bible than somebody else. Um, it's to study and find out about the person of Jesus. And the more we eat that word, the more we become like what we eat. And we say we are what we eat. That's why I say the word eternalizes us. The word matters. Um, in Hebrews, it says God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is looking for people who want him, not his stuff, uh, not his accolades, um, not quote unquote, what we call blessings and things, because the blessing is the fact that he died for us and he went to hell for us and he rose for us. And, and, and we were rightfully called the body of Christ because of that. Uh, we know the scripture in Matthew seven, it says, not everybody who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of God. Um, you know, we cast out demons, we heal the sick, we prophesy, and the Lord would say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Then he also says in Luke 10, he tells the disciples that I've given unto you power and authority. And they say, even the demons are subject to us. But he said, don't get caught up in that. Just to be thankful that your name is written in the book of life. So that's that's the end game. That's the end result. Obviously, we have work to do on that earth. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, that's the common denominator that all of us must have in Christ Jesus, that we have repented of our sins, confessed the Lord as our Savior and begin to walk in the admonition of who he is and his laws and his ways. Now, it says a study to show thyself approved. That word approve is not, we're not seeking God's approval because we study more. We already been approved by Christ. We're already in him and he's in us. The word approve means to be test. It means to be tried. It means that you've done an acceptable work. Romans 12 and one says, um, Romans 12 and one. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Romans 12 and one. Test and try, acceptable and righteous unto God. That that's our reasonable uh, a service to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Because um, we could be doing the right thing for the wrong reason, which, uh, which, which we would be operating in our own righteousness other than the righteousness of God. And a workman is not a shame. The workman is a laborer. He's a plowman. He, he endures. And our labor is in the word. And we make choice to submit to that word because the word has already done the work. That's when Jesus said he is finished. Yes, we're going to have obstacles and things come at us, but we count it on joy because we believe and trust in what God has told us. We, we are plowing. The Bible says if a man takes his hands off the plow and look back, he's not fit for the kingdom. So that's why we don't, one of the reasons we don't get caught up in the affairs of this world, because if we focus on that, then we're going to be subject to go back to the things that we used to. And our conversation won't be of the things of Christ. Our thoughts won't be of the things of Christ. Joshua 1 and, 1 and 8 says we meditate on the word day and night. A workman that is not unashamed. Romans 1.16 says, Paul says, uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God under salvation. Uh, we pronounce the gospel of Jesus with great authority, with great power, and with great boldness. We don't boast in ourselves. We boast in Christ. But Jesus said, if you deny me in front of man, I deny you in front of my father. So we are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of our testimony. We are not ashamed of what God brought us out. That's why we can be uh, authentic in what we tell people when I give when we give our testimony. Uh, we can be uh, give it with great clarity and with great accuracy. We can say things like God delivered us from crack cocaine and powder cocaine and alcohol and promiscuity and, 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 and sexual indiscretions and all of these things. And we can be specific in that because we understand it wasn't our doing. It was Christ that was doing it. And we boast in that. Therefore, we are not ashamed of the gospel. Second Timothy 1 and 8 says, be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, 
nor of me his prisoner, but be partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. Understand when he's talking about affliction, he's talking about laying down his flesh. He's talking about laying down We don't, we don't, not self, it's not self-inflicted wounds as some may think, but it's laying down our flesh and our flesh doesn't want to co doesn't want to go cooperate. The Bible says that the flesh is enmity against the spirit. So when we say we're struggling, it's really, we're not laying down our will. But when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, when he said, Lord, can you take this bitter cup off of me? Then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Every time we say that, and acting, nevertheless, not my will, but his will be done. Every struggle has to cease. And then we move on to the next thing in God. So that means we have to constantly on the daily lay our flesh down. That means we lay down our will, what we think, what we feel and what we want. And we ask God what it is that he wants and what he wants us to do and how he wants us to do it. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12 for one twelve says, for this which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So once again, Paul is talking about suffering. We got to be a people that's going to have to learn how to suffer, that's going to have to learn how to endure hardship as good soldiers. And we understand we don't do it in our own power. And God would not put anything on us that he knows we couldn't handle. But at the same time, whatever God is asking me to do, and whatever God is asking you to do, he's given us the grace to do it. So it's really not a thing of I'm not there yet. Wherever you are in your walk, God is going to require you to do something. And if he's requiring you to do it, that means he's giving you the grace to do it. We just got to move in faith. Um we ought to be doers of the word. If it's going to internalize us, if the word really matters, then we got to be doers. James 1.25 says, a man who looks in the mirror, who is not a doer of the word, and he's not a doer, and he looks in the mirror, it's like he never saw his reflection. It says he's forgotten it. That word forgotten means he's neglected it. That means, I, really, it means that we've rebelled against it. We've heard the word, but we chose not to move in it, which is rebellion. I mean, we can try to chop it up any kind of way we want to. We can say we're not perfect or we can say everybody makes mistakes. But the call on our life is to become like Christ. So uh, if we're going to work, if the word is going to eternalize us and the word matters, we have to shift our thinking. And as opposed to everybody makes mistakes and nobody's perfect, which they do, we got to say, I'm going to do the will of God. And if I'm not in line with doing the will of God, and I know I was supposed to, James also says to know what to do and not do it is sin. You just repent. That means you change your thought and you turn it to God. Some people say repentance is changing your thought to something else. It's not changing your thought to something else. It's changing your thought to what God originally told you. That's true repentance. So it says, I am not ashamed for I know in whom I believe and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You got to be fully persuaded that I'm going to trust God and I'm going to do it. And whatever it is that comes against me, the fact that we've here and he's brought us through what we've been through is proof positive of who he is. He's the same God. It doesn't matter the situation nor the circumstance. So the same God who brought you out of that yesterday is still the same God who wants to do or work in you, whatever your circumstances and situations is today. But we came out of that by focusing on God and not the thing that was behind us. Paul said, I count myself to have not yet apprehended in Philippians chapter 313. But this one thing I do know, I'm forgetting those things that are in the past and I'm reaching for those things are in front of me. I press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. But many of us have said, I count myself to have not yet apprehended. And then we stop there. That's what many of us has done. But we have a, a deserving God, a willing God, a faithful God who has proven himself time and time again. And as we grow in God, we got to understand that we're going to be stretched. We're going to be tried. And uh, the, the testing of our faith worketh patience. 
Um, I heard it said that a, a man's faith who has not been tested is a man who, you, who cannot be trusted. If you haven't been through anything, if you haven't endured anything, um, how can I trust you? Um, how can you effectively and truthfully say, I'm praying for you if you haven't endured anything? How do you know what to pray for? What do you know what to pray for? So we're talking about suffering. Paul did work. Most of his ministry was in, in, in prison. And he endured just like Christ did. Christ said he endured the cross, despising the shame. And that placed him above all principalities and powers. And when we endure whatever we endure, that places us above the last thing where we was bound in. And understanding if we're not going to be ashamed, um, faith is going to put us in a place of ridicule. It's going to make us look foolish. Because earlier in 14, it says, um, don't be arguing. Don't be quarreling about words. And in our flesh, we want to argue. We want to quarrel because um, people are going to take jabs at you. They're going to take personal shots at you. And it's going to make you look like a fool. So your faith is your faith and your trust in God is going to put you in the place of ridicule. Luke 6, 26 says, woe unto you and all men shall like you. Everybody don't like you. And it ain't necessarily you. It's the Christ in you. Everybody don't believe in your testimony. Everybody don't believe that you've changed, that you've been transformed. And everybody ain't going to like you because of it. So you have to continue to press forward and do the work of God and not focus on them and not be concerned about what it is that they're saying or what they're doing. Because you're not on trial for public opinion or to be popular or to prove a point. You've been approved by God. And if you really believe that you've been approved by God, you'll be like Jesus when he was on the cross. And you'll say, He'll, you'll never say a mumbling word because I know who I am. I know who I belong to. I know what I've been called to do. I don't need to get back at you. I don't need to backbite. I don't need to talk about you. I just keep moving forward. I keep plowing and doing the things that God has called me to do. It says approved by God. It says it's, it's not saying that the more you study, the more you approve. It says, when you follow me in my word by the spirit, you'll be tried and trusted in me through the process. Proves your sonship. Proves that you belong to me. It shows other people, whether they recognize it or not, in their quiet time, they're going to have to say they saw the hell that you've been through. And they saw how you endured. They saw the Christ likeness that you showed when you went through this process. And you can be just like Jesus said to the son, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And every time we go through a test and every time we go through a trial and we do it in a Christ-like fashion, in a Christ-like manner, he is going to say to you, this is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. And we want to be pleasing to God. Um, we are to be Christ in the earth. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that is alive inside of us. And our natural minds can't fathom that. But we are to be Christ in the earth because we have Holy Spirit that gives us the capability and the power to do exactly everything that Christ did in the earth. So when you when people say, um, um, well, you think you're holier than thou and that you're a saint. We are saints. We are not sinners saved by grace. You cannot be a sinner and a saint. If you call yourself a sinner, you can't pray for me because your prayers have no power. Your prayer, they are tingling. But you can't pray for me if you call yourself a sinner. You don't have the power to pray for me if you says I'm just a nobody trying to tell somebody about everybody. I We are not a nobody in Christ Jesus. If we are the elect, if we are the chosen one, if we've been set aside, if we are the best of the best, then you need to start proclaiming that and speaking that over your life. And this is the reason why many of us are double-minded, which can lead to mental illness, because we're saying one thing, but we're believing another thing in our heart. So the Bible says, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth that you know, the truth that you become one with, the truth that's set in your heart. Your heart is the seat of judgment for you. That's the seat of your belief system. So when we believe it in our heart and confess it with our mouth, then we shall be saved. Then we shall be healed. Then we shall be delivered. Then we shall be set free. It serves absolutely no purpose in God just to quote scripture, just to sound like you smart or just to sound like, uh, you know, you're not the person that you used to be. The goal for us is not to get better. I mean, it sounds good and we are better, but that's not the goal. The goal is to become like Christ, period. That's it. 
every day is to become like Christ. And Christ didn't come to this earth to get better. He came to destroy the work, the works of the enemy. And that's our job, to plunder the gates of hell, to advance the kingdom, to walk in sanctification. That means we are set apart each and every single day. And we must be intentional about our purpose, about what God has called us to do. If we don't know our purpose, we find that in the seek. This is, that's what studying is. That's what seeking him. We don't seek purpose. We seek the purpose pusher. We seek the hope dealer. That is Christ Jesus by Holy Spirit. And in doing that and walking it out with fear and trembling and going through the process and doing suffering and doing afflictions, that's how we find out what God is going to call us to do. And it's going to cost you. It's going to cost us. Then it says to um, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly divide means it means to straight. It means an accurate cut. It means a straight course. It means correctly. It says with the print with with precision. So um, the Bible says that the word cuts like a double edged sword. So we don't have to add anything to the word. Or we don't have to take anything from the word. If we're reading Second Timothy, then the crux of what we're talking about has to come from Second Timothy. So we got to understand what Paul is saying. We all have heard the scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. But we want to read 1 through 14 so we can get an understanding of why he's saying what he's saying and the purpose of what he's saying and the backdrop of what's happening. Then we bring it into today's time. Um, one of the most, we, we say this term, a very familiar passage of scripture. And one of those is the race is not given to the swift or the fast, but the one who endureth till the end. That's in the Bible, but that's two different scriptures. The beginning of that is in the book of Ecclesiastes. The end of that is in the book of Matthew. So we've took that and made it a word. That's that's not contextual. That's so, so that means we've took the word out of context. So that means we've made God's word what we want it to be. I don't know anybody who would want somebody to misinterpret what they're saying to them, but yet we misinterpret the word all the time. So last week I talked about allegiance and who's your allegiance to. Thank God for all the people that ushered us in, grandma, granddaddy, whoever it was that ushered us into Christ. But what if grandma was wrong? What if granddaddy was wrong? What if they was incorrect? What if they didn't get the whole truth? This is why I says study to show thyself approved. So my allegiance has to be to Christ. It can't be what I learned back then. Um, and then at the same time, it may be true, but God is a revelator. He's revealed himself. So we can re read one scripture and God can continue to speak through that same word. So what I know now or what I believe about a certain scripture may not what I believe about it later on because God has revealed more to it. He's, he's opened the eyes of our enlightenment. So we got to be a people who know God for ourselves. We got to be people that's willing to have an ear to hear and to take heed to what God is saying and not be afraid. Well, yeah, that's what grandma taught me back there, but I, that's not what God has revealed to me right now. And you got to be OK with that because you're going to have to be the one that's going to have to walk out your soul salvation. You're the one who we're, we're the one who stand before God every single day. We're responsible for getting what it is that we need from God. So I can't blame anybody else for what I've been taught. Yeah, you may have been taught that back then, but now when I was a child, I spoke, I learned, I did as a child. But when I became a man, when I became mature, I walked, I spoke, I learned as a mature man. So that means I have to study the word for myself. I have to understand and come to the realization that the word matters to me. I want the word to internalize me. James 3 and 1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that he who teach will be judged more strictly. This is another reason why we need to handle the word correctly, why we need to search the scriptures to see if these things be true. Um, our pastor always leads us to Christ. I even said in this sermon Sunday, that word, that's what he gave him. He may not have given it. To somebody else and this is probably some people who may be on here right now who can testify to say last week that word wasn't for me <laughs> and it may not have been but i'm just saying we got to have ears to hear and our heart postures right and begin to ask god questions 
What are you saying? God, illuminate your word to me. Help me understand what it is you're saying. The Bible says he who lacks wisdom should ask. People say, well, you shouldn't question God. Well, that, that ain't a relationship. We should question God. We should be asking him questions. He, he's real. If he's real to us, if his word matters to us, then we need to be talking. We need to be, keep, be communicating. We, could go, we need full. God wants full disclosure. That's how we have a, a, a intimate and up close personal relationship with him. Yes, God knows all, but he wants to talk. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to reveal himself to you and show you some things about yourself, show you to you that you've never met before. So this is why the word matters. This is why we need to eternalize the word. This is why we need to stay contextual because there's a lot of deception going on right now. A lot of people are teaching what they want to teach. Uh, some of it is because they want to control people. It's various reasons. But you and I both need to work, need to know the word for ourselves. That's a mandate. That's a command from God. That's why I says study to show thyself approved. And we need to know the word. It's a life giver. It's water. Uh, it washes uh, our minds and our conscience of dead works. So we won't be remembering things that we've done in the past. And you can't do that with a dip and dab type relationship. You've been in relationships before. You've been in marriages before, whatever the case may be. Two hours on, two hours one day a week, that's not a relationship. Yeah, that's not a relationship. That's just wanting God when we want God. Or we want what we want, or we want to get out of it, or we want to make ourselves feel good because we came to church. We're going to have to stop playing patty cake with this thing. Uh, the gospel is bloody. The gospel is real. The gospel is true. The gospel is all power. It's all authority. And anytime you got you got demonic powers coming against you and against your family, everything in you is going to have to change. We've talked about this several times before, but we got to grasp this concept that like the past, this fight is real. This assignment is real. Souls are at stake. So we cannot be afraid or ashamed, as Paul says, to declare and decree and pronounce the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he gave us Holy Spirit for while we're on this earth to do what it is that he called us to do with great power, with great authority and with great boldness because we understand God is before us and he's behind us. He's already done the work. He's already finished the work. He said the righteous are as bold as a lion. You are the righteousness of God. It serves no purpose for you to keep reminding yourself of all the things that you're not when God says who you are in him. You are complete in him. You're blameless before him because of the blood of Christ Jesus. The blood has washed away all of our sins. We are no longer sinners. We are saints. We are the elect. We are a superpower in the earth. We are Jesus Christ in the earth because of the power of Holy Spirit. This is what he's called us to do, to advance his kingdom, to plunder the gates, the gates of hell, to set captives free, to heal the sick, to deliver people, to break chains. And we need to get fully engaged and fully involved and let this word eternalize us and let our light shine in this deep, dark world. Pick our head up because God is the lifter of our head. He is the one who has promoted us. He is the one who has done a good work inside of us and he will complete it until the end. And you will finish your race. You will birth out what God has called you to birth out. But we got to move, myself included. I got a strong rebuke from God this week while I was on vacation. And he's like he told the disciples, how, how long am I going to be with you? How long do we keep have to having this same conversation about stuff you know you need to do? If you say you have faith, if you stay, you're going to step out of the boat. You keep saying, well, it's, it's my time. Well, if it's your time, we, we got to show ourselves approved. We got to step outside of the out of the boat and we got to walk in the things of God and we got to begin to move. And we cannot be concerned about what people are saying or what people are doing. It's written in this word. People going to come against you. We got to be discerning in this hour. We got to have word inside of us, not just quote scripture, but word. The spirit of truth. I pray that come alive inside of you, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation. And we shall walk in all the things that God has had and called us to walk in. And when I say things, I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about the things of God. The inside work, the outside to take care of itself. Because once you get, he starts to do a work inside of you, you'll start to see different. 
you'll start to look at things different. Your perspective will change because you'll be seeing things from God's point of view instead of our own point of view. So some of the stuff we buy and some of the situations we got ourselves into is because of rejection or because we don't feel worthy or because it makes us feel good. But we got to get an up close and personal relationship with God and understand that he is real, that he is alive inside of me and he wants the absolute best for me. And that's to walk in peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. That's the word that eternalizes us. That's the word that matters. So this week, get that in your mind. The word matters. Meditate on it. Chew on it. Sit at the table. Bask in his presence. Talk to him all day, every day about any and all situations going on in your life. And begin to thank him for what you have and where you are at this juncture in your life. So that's my time. Uh, Y'all have a blessed week. Uh, I hope this word bless you. I hope it speaks to your heart. And um, I pray that uh, it manifests in your life. Peace.